Hi, I'm Cynthia Cortman Westfall, a Broadway music director, voice coach, and tenured professor in the musical theater department at the University of Michigan. And I'm Chelsea Wilson, a performer turned voice teacher to Broadway stars and vocal coach on Broadway productions like The Phantom of the Opera, School of Rock, and more. Here on the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, you can expect real talk about the business, practical advice, and constant encouragement. We believe there's space for every artist in this industry. All you need is the right support. So consider us your two-woman hype team. Welcome to the Broadway Vocal Coach Podcast, where we help musical theater performers get unstuck and take the next step in their careers. Today, we are so excited to welcome to the podcast, Ms. Hannah Flam. Hannah, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Where are you joining us from tonight? I'm currently in Lenox Hill Hospital, located in the Upper East Side of New York City. To be clear, you're working there. And not, not as a patient, a patient at Lenox Hill <laughs> Hospital. Yes, <laughs> I am, I'm definitely not a patient. I work for the Department of Neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, and I'm currently in one of our attending physicians' offices. So there's a bunch of brains and skulls and degrees behind me that are not mine, but I, I, I would like to say that I was called Dr. Flam when I first joined the practice. So I like to joke I'm a doctor in marketing, even though I don't Please. have Please <laughs> run with it, stick with it and run with it. Absolutely. Don't let that go. That. With that, let me share with our audience just a little bit about Hannah. Hannah is a singer, actor, dancer, stand-up comedian, and project manager based in New York City. Born and raised in Minneapolis, Hannah grew up dreaming of becoming a paleontologist or a physical therapist. It wasn't until her choir teacher encouraged her to audition for the school play that Hannah realized her true passion was theater. Hannah attended the University of Michigan and graduated with the highest honors and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in musical theater performance. When she's not performing, Hannah is a digital marketing project manager for the Department of Neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital. There she is, making that happen right as we speak. She also teaches Pilates at Pilates Heights, Brooklyn. She has successfully completed her comprehensive Pilates certification through Balanced Body and her bar certification through Extend Bar. Hannah is passionate about helping others live happy and healthy lives and is thrilled to pursue careers in the theater, healthcare, and wellness industries. And that is what we're going to be talking with you all about today. So thanks for being here. Yes. Thank you for listing off my crazy resume. I feel like <laughs> I've, I've, I've taken on being a multi-hyphenate theater girly and like have just kept adding on with elements of my life. You're like, and let's add another hyphen and another yes. hyphen. <laughs> this is how we do it, friends. This is how we do it. Well, that's exactly right. So, you know, we wanted to do an episode about alternate career paths outside of musical theater or as an extension of one's musical theater training. And you came to mind. You know, you and Cynthia go way back. And all the interesting things that you're doing now, we want to hear about them. And we want to hear about how this all came to be and also how your musical theater training comes into play in any or all of these things. So we'll be diving into all of that today. Tell us about your background in musical theater. When did you discover performing and was it something that you always wanted to do? How did, how did that begin? Yeah. So I, when I was a child, you know, like most performers, I had just this crazy energy and I was very creative and would often put on shows for my family and make up my own musicals and was just very, very much a performer from, you know, an early age. And my sister actually, when I saw that she was doing dance when I was younger, I was like, oh, well, I want to do dance. And I kind of copied everything she did. And so I started dancing when I was three. And then I saw my sister starting to do theater camps. And I was like, well, I want to do theater camp. And I actually like didn't do a proper musical until high school because I was participating in competitive dance throughout my elementary school years and middle school years. And then in high school, I switched my focus more to ballet and was doing a lot of point work and kept getting stress fractures in my right foot. And so I was like, okay, maybe being a professional ballet dancer is not in the stars for me. And the, the biggest, I think, impetus for me to start pursuing musical theater and thinking that it was actually something attainable and a possibility for me was a teacher of mine. I had a choir teacher from freshman year of high school to senior year of high school. Mr. Voss was an incredible mentor to me and 
we actually would have like small group kind of privates to practice our choral parts. And after one of our little privates, he pulled me aside and he said, Hannah, you really have a gift. And I think that you should explore your voice. And this was during that period of time where I was figuring out what do I want to do if I'm not a dancer anymore? Who am I? And so I started participating in our school choir. I did our show choir, which I feel like show choir was kind of the gateway to, you know, being in musicals. Yes. <laughs> my very first show, I, I, I was finally confident enough in myself to audition for The Wizard of Oz. And I was cast as the Wicked Witch of the West and Miss Gulch. And there was something that happened when I got on that stage where it just felt like all of the stars aligned. I was able to express myself through music, through dance, through movement and I didn't realize how much I loved comedy and like how wonderful it was to like be playing this role. And I just thought that Miss Gulch was just the crabbiest lady. And I tried to play her so straight. And it was funny to me that in my mind, I was very serious, but it was just hilarious for everyone to see, you know, this ridiculous character come to life. And that really completely changed what I wanted to do with my life. Before I was thinking, I, you said it in my intro, I was like, oh, do I want to be a paleontologist? Like growing up, that's what I thought I wanted to be. And then and then I really liked biology and I liked anatomy and kinesiology. So I'm like, okay, maybe I want to be a PT. But then as soon as I did that musical, I'm like, no, I'm going to school for musical theater. And I was crazy. I decided to research top 10 musical theater programs in the country. <laughs> and then great place to start. And then I, whew, and then you then you figure it out. And then I figured <laughs> yeah. it out. Yeah. I auditioned for three schools. Michigan was my top school and I got in and it was the easiest answer of my life. As soon as I got my acceptance letter, I was just like, yes, I know, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. And I'm really grateful I chose Michigan because of the incredible programs that are outside of the School of Music, Theater and Dance. You know, the, the school is just really remarkable. And I was able to take some kinesiology courses in, in college and I took a marketing course and I took some creative writing courses. So having that component of my liberal arts degree and, and the freedom to explore other interests was really, really beneficial for me, especially now that I'm pursuing so many different things. But I feel like really my education has really served me. And then there's a lot of things too that I learned from, you know, my acting teachers, my voice teachers, my dance teachers, all the professors in the musical theater department have taught me lessons that have applied to everything that I'm doing now, not just performing. I love that, Hannah. I always find it so fascinating when people do have multiple interests, you know, and I think that's really natural and normal that you love musical theater, you love to sing, you love to dance, but you're also really interested in anatomy and really interested in kinesiology and all these other things. So talk to us about how when you graduated... What was that experience like? Did you have an expectation for what you thought would happen? Did you already know that maybe Pilates would be a great side hustle while you're auditioning? Tell us a little about what it was like right after graduation. Well, I was thinking ahead while I was in school. I'm like, what am I going to do for my side hustle? And I've been doing Pilates since I was 13. I thought about becoming a Pilates instructor since I was 15 years old something that's always been in the back of my mind. And because I wasn't pursuing physical therapy, I didn't really like think about getting a double major. I, I was like, maybe I can just pursue my Pilates certification instead. And that way, when I graduate, I'll be able to have a job that is flexible and that will enable me to audition and allow me to share my love for Pilates. So incredible for a dancer, too, that as of someone auditioning for musical theater, like it's keeping you in such amazing shape for dance auditions. And Exactly. It's such a functional movement practice, and it really just trains you to find balance in your body and to make sure that you're keeping your spine healthy by mobilizing it and supporting your spine with your core. And as a dancer and a performer, for me, these were important tools to have. So I was already interested in finding that for myself. And so pursuing my Pilates certification my junior and senior year, it didn't feel like extra work. It was 
very fun for me. I actually practiced with Mark Madama on a reformer in the basement of the Walgreen and got all of my hours in, got certified. And I was like, great, I'm ready to graduate. I'm going to teach Pilates, audition. And by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be on Broadway. That was my expectation. I was. That's my plan too. That was my plan yeah. too, Hannah. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, not Pilates, but voice teaching. But yes, yes. so similar. Yes. And well, when I got here, I got very lucky. I actually, after Showcase, ended up signing with an agent and I had representation and I booked my dream show. I did the producers at Paper Mill Playhouse and I got to understudy Ula. And I was like, oh my God, like this is what it's going to be. Like I'm golden. I booked immediately after graduation. I'm going to have that fresh, you know, shiny credit on my resume. And I'm, you know, casting directors are going to have to cast me and, and, you know, bring me in. And that's not what happened. I didn't work for another year after that. And then after that, I haven't done a proper musical since 2017, actually, but I did do, I was an associate choreographer at Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera, and I did some readings in the city and was a part of some developmental labs, but my career definitely wasn't going where I wanted it to go. And I also didn't realize that just teaching Pilates was not going to support me. So I ended up taking on all of these extra survival jobs. I was at one point, I think I had nine side gigs. Like I was dog walking, oh babysitting, gosh. teaching oh a children's gosh. theater camp. I was temping. I, I was working at the front desk of my Pilates studio. I was doing social media for my Pilates studio. And so I took on so much and I was so motivated to accomplish this goal. I'm going to be on Broadway by the time I'm 30 that I started to neglect my physical health and well-being. And at the end of 2019, I herniated a disc in my lower back between my L4, L5 vertebrae. And me being like, I, I have to keep pushing. I have to keep going. I completely ignored my symptoms. I did not go to the doctor soon enough. And I ended up developing a condition that's very dangerous. It's called cauda equina syndrome. And Essentially, there's a nerve at the base of your spine called the horse tail nerve or the cauda equina nerve because it looks kind of like a horse's tail. And that nerve was completely impinged by my herniated disc. So I lost sensation in the backs of my legs, both my feet and underneath my pelvis. So like I couldn't feel if I was going to the bathroom, which is the, the very dangerous part about this condition. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, I was misdiagnosed twice before I got the care that I needed. I was told I was having a back spasm. And in my mind, I started to listen to my gut. I'm like, you know what? No, this isn't okay. I can't keep pushing myself. I need to get help. And I need to be, you know, humble enough to ask for that help. Cause in, I was thinking I was indestructible. I was, you know, 25 and I was young, healthy, active, I didn't think that this could happen to me. And that was a really huge lesson in just learning how to take care of yourself, take care of your instrument, and also to not say yes to everything. Because at that point, I wasn't saying no to anybody. And it cost me in terms of my well-being. And luckily, I'm okay. I'm all good now. I had an emergency back surgery, not at oh. Lenox Hill, but I had a great surgeon at NYU <laughs> who operated on me. And I've made a full recovery. I'm able to dance again and move again. But that made me reevaluate things and reevaluate how sustainable my lifestyle was. So... I made the decision to get a desk job while I was recovering from my surgery. And I was thinking about going back to school for physical therapy. And I thought it would be a good idea to work as an administrator at a physical therapy office. And that's how I got my foot in the door in the healthcare industry. And, you know, it's, it really is wild, again, how applicable everything I have learned as an actor has been as an administrator and as somebody working in healthcare, like I already knew how to be a professional without having worked in a business setting, which is very strange because most actors are like, this is very foreign, but I could see where there were intersections between the work I was doing, writing emails to my agents and making sure I know how to write a professional email that completely served me as an administrator, being organized and on top of my schedule and making sure that I have a plan before I start my day and that I know what to expect and to anticipate 
you know, the unforeseen things as well, you know, to improvise in situations where maybe a, a patient, you know, comes in and they're, they're upset and being able to improvise and come up with creative solutions to help that patient solve that problem. And so that was really amazing for me. And I actually was then promoted to a leadership role where I was doing training and development for administrative coordinators after a year. And my public speaking skills, they would be non-existence without my theater training. I've always, always been complimented on my ability to just be in a room and speak and command the room. And that's something that I really feel is second nature to me because of all my training. And also the ability to energize the room and to work with people's energy and to pull energy out of people when they aren't giving it. Sometimes I, I, I do an improvisational exercises with groups of people if I'm you know trying to do icebreakers and it's, it's really fun to see people open up and feel open to play. So that's been really wonderful. And then after doing that, <laughs> I was doing a lot of documentation and like copywriting and, and design and, and being able to do graphic design was so fantastic for me. It was another creative outlet in this professional setting. I felt like it gave me artistic freedom to, to be creative. And so I, I changed roles and I was the assistant practice manager at a workers comp, no fault, orthopedic surgery practice and the training and development director there for about eight months. And then I realized, oh, this role is not creative enough for me, like just administration. And the role that I am currently in, it, it happened very serendipitously. I ran into my old colleague, Sana, on the train. And she's like, how, how are things going at your practice? I'm like, oh, I, you know, I'm thinking about leaving. I don't know if this is the right fit for me. And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I haven't thought of you for this role that we're looking to fill at Lenox Hill Hospital. We're looking for someone who can do social media content management, somebody who can create patient educational materials, someone who can do graphic design, someone who can help with educational programming, someone who can basically just be the hype woman for the department. I, I can't imagine like someone who hasn't had a theater background doing this role, because again, it's like, I, I feel like it's so collaborative and I, I'm using all these skills that I gained as a performer and an actor and and even skills that I've learned from my you know colleagues that I've worked with on shows. I actually produced a conference this year where we had over 130 guests come to Lenox Hill Hospital and it was for what we called the Brain Tumor Biotech Summit. And we brought leaders in the world of neuro-oncology, clinical research, and we also brought in venture capitalists who invest in neurotechnologies and clinical trials. And it just was just a big collaboration of all of these professionals. And I ended up being like the stage manager for this event. I had a call sheet. <laughs> Everything was time to the minute. I was the MC. I was announcing everybody. I had like a dress rehearsal before the event. And it was just like, I was like, I feel like a stage manager and like, you know, I feel like kind of like a producer trying to get everything together. And it was just like, really, that project was so fun for me, because it really, again, I got to do something I've never done before. And something that I didn't know I was capable of. Yet I had all of the skill sets that I needed to achieve that. So that was really cool. It sounds like you've been able to flex your muscles, your, all of your skills in so many different ways over these past few years. And I just, I love hearing about all of that. That's so cool. I want to go back to kind of that experience post-college that you were talking about. And I really appreciate you speaking so candidly about like, I booked this amazing show and this is going to be my life now. And, and then it not going to that plan. I'm curious, you know, you talk about having a lot of drive and that, you know, that drive at the time kind of caused you to overlook some of the, the physical symptoms that you were having in those years and whatnot. Tell me a little bit about what that feels like to have that strong drive for your dream and for it not to be going exactly to plan. What did that feel like? Were you able to talk about it in the moment? Was it embarrassing? What was that like? Yeah, it was really, really difficult. After the producers closed, I was I was auditioning and like immediately after and I was getting into final callbacks for things and things weren't panning out for me. 
And I started to completely overanalyze everything I was doing. And I started to have this really toxic internal monologue that I think a lot of performers have. What's wrong with me? Why am I not able to break through and, and get cast in another show? So for me, it was like, okay, is it my body? Is it the way I, you know, I look and I present myself? Is it the material that I'm bringing in? And what ended up happening was I became an inauthentic version of myself. And mm, I was trying so hard. Yeah, I was trying so hard to fit this ideal of whatever the casting directors were looking for, whatever the creative team was looking for, that I really feel like I lost a sense of myself. And going through that for a couple of years and feeling frustrated for a couple of years really did, it made me feel, feel like I was failing. And even though I wasn't, it's just this industry is, it's all about luck, timing and preparation, just being in the right place at the right time in the room with the right people, you know, at a certain level, it has nothing to do with talent or ability. It's, it's, you know, apples and oranges. And I was internalizing that and thinking I'm not good enough. And I also really identified as a singer, dancer, actor. I felt deep in my core, this is my identity. And I didn't realize my potential beyond that. And so being forced to make this lifestyle change for my physical health has honestly been one of the greatest gifts because I have realized, okay, no, I'm so much more than that. Like, let's not put labels on things. I'm smart. I'm ambitious. I'm driven. I'm creative. I'm hardworking. I'm kind. Like I have all these other qualities and attributes that are so wonderful. And I'm not just a singer, dancer, actor. I'm a, a three-dimensional person. And I really feel like I am the most authentic version of myself now because I'm not limiting myself on what I can be and what I can do with my life, which I actually, this summer, I really missed performing and I was trying to find a way to get back on stage. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do stand-up comedy. I'm just going to do it. This is a gutsy <laughs> move, my friend. And I think it is so cool. I am so there for it. I've watched all your clips on Instagram. I'm like, yes, here she goes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It is honestly, I feel so liberated. It has been the most fun I've had on stage, like in a really long time, because I, I give myself permission to not judge myself when I do stand up, which is crazy. Cause most people are like, that's terrifying. Like, aren't you afraid that people won't laugh? I'm like, no, not really. Like, I'm just happy to be on stage. <laughs> like, that's really <laughs> incredible. I just really don't. I'm like, yes, I care, but not that much because for me, because I have this career that's outside of performing, I'm able to perform for fun now. And also with stand-up, I get to write my own material. And this is the first mm -hmm. time I've, I've written material for myself. And so to be able to explore that and, you know, I still have a ton of friends who are in the industry and I'll run my material by them and to collaborate with them on my jokes and to tighten things up. It's just been such a fun process. And also meeting people who are not performers, who are stand-ups, who are like, yeah, I've always wanted to do stand-up. I just started pursuing this for fun. It's really cool to see that. And it's really wonderful to connect with people through humor and through shared experiences. A lot of stand-ups now, it's more like self-referential -ref material that's kind of popular nowadays with stand-up. So a lot of people talk about their lives and things that are really relatable. And it's powerful to be able to talk about those difficult things and awkward things and laugh about it. So it's been a really wonderful journey. It feels like you went from that period of time of not being your authentic self to now putting yourself in this situation where it's only your authentic self. You know, yes. I just feel like when I see you in those videos on Instagram, it's like, wow, this is Hannah up there on stage. There's no persona. There's no character to hide behind. There's no show to hide in. There's no costume. Well, you did have one costume that I really love. I did have one costume. <laughs> I did go on stage in a nude bodysuit for one of my last shows. It was the day after Halloween. And I really just, I thought it would be funny to wear a costume. And I'm like, 
I was naked Rose from Titanic. So I wore Which is the best new... costume I've ever seen in my life. It was amazing. I, I really don't know how I'm going to top it. I'm like, oh, man, I, I peaked now in my Halloween creativity. But even, that, but even, <laughs> even that costume was so authentically you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't feel like a show costume. It felt like Hannah, Hannah's costume. Yes. <laughs> so I just yes. love that you're doing something that feels so authentically you, especially after going through that period where you didn't feel like you were able to bring yourself to the work like you did when you first started out. I just love that. What a cool pivot. Performing pivot. Still performing. Yes. But that one, that one's really cool. Yes. And you know, it's funny because I think you said it, I'm not playing a character. I'm playing myself. I mean, I am maybe a caricature of myself on stage, but I'm still myself. And, you know, there's nothing I love more than doing character study and, and really getting into like the psyche of who you're playing and, and getting to bring that person to life. But again, it's just been a really wonderful way for me to reclaim performing on my own terms. And to feel like I am good enough without having to be X, Y, or Z. I can just be myself. And I've always had this pipe dream. I mean, I've always loved comedy and like, I didn't realize I was funny, but I've always loved comedy. And as a kid, I grew up watching SNL. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. I would love to do that. And so now since I started doing stand up, I'm kind of pursuing this pipe dream of maybe doing sketch comedy and pursuing this dream of being on SNL and I'm going to be taking classes at UCB and doing more improv in the new year and exploring that. And I don't know, like, even if I don't end up on SNL, it's just been really fun to not limit myself to, I must be on Broadway. It's Broadway or bust. And, and I'm realizing, no, there's so many other things. I love what you said a few minutes ago about, you know, I have this job now that I love that I'm getting paid for. And so now when I get up to do stand-up comedy, it's because I love it. It's because I love being on stage. And I love that. And all y'all know I love the book Big Magic. But it's one of the things <laughs> that I think she talks about. Here like, she goes. Here I go. Magic. Big Magic. I think Elizabeth Gilbert needs to give me a commission. I'm selling so many books for her. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> you, you, you have kept this in the New York Times bestseller list but for the past this two years this one resonates with me so much is like, not putting the pressure on your artistry that your artistry has to be the thing that makes you the money. And if your artistry isn't making you the money, then somehow that's a failure of some kind. And I just don't buy into that. And I love that you're making money elsewhere. And that allows you to continue to do what you love to do, get up on stage, make people laugh. And you don't have the pressure of it having to be the thing that makes you money. If it does, if you get on SNL, I will cheer harder than anybody in your life. But it's okay if you don't. You're still doing what you love. You're still up there on stage making people laugh. And I just, I think that's so great. Thank you. It's just been the most wonderful gift. And I, I didn't anticipate to be getting asked to do shows and to perform and line up so quickly. I took a class and I did a showcase. And so I got some really good footage from that showcase. And because I had studied comedy in, in college and I took a, like a principles of comedy class, I understood the structure of comedic writing. And I, I really understand comedic timing because of the shows that I have done and because of my incredible acting teachers. So it was cool to see how that lent itself to this new creative endeavor as well. And it's really nice to be able to feel like I don't have to book a job or don't have to book a show in order to survive. And it's really nice also to have a job that is fulfilling and isn't my everything because I am able to leave my work at work. I'm able to say, okay, I'm clocking out. I'm done for the day. Whereas when I was performing, it was constant. I was 24 seven pursuing that dream. So again, it's, it's just enabled me to, to take off pressure and, and just let my creative being out and just let her go rogue. <laughs> I love that. I also, I'm going to take this opportunity. Hopefully I won't start crying, but you know me, I might. So I had two back surgeries as well. And we're both six feet tall, which is going to come into play in one second. 
And when I was going through all of my recovery and then I re-injured and yada, yada, and had a couple of long hospital stays and just lots of drama, drama, drama with all of that. And it could literally barely move, barely walk. Like I really couldn't do much. And I thought, I'm going to call Hannah. Maybe Hannah can do something with Pilates. And the fact that you were six feet tall and I was six feet tall, I was in a place where I can't handle working with anyone who's like five foot two and petite. I need someone to know what it's like to live in a six foot tall body. (laughs) It's a lot of bone structure we're dealing with, with six feet tall. And the patience you brought and the care you brought. I mean, I hadn't really done Pilates before. I didn't know what I was doing. I was so terrified of moving my body in any way. And you know, it wasn't moving much when we started. And what I'm able to do now is was literally life changing. And I just want to say that out loud and publicly because you transformed my life in ways I can't even put into words. Someday I'll put it into words better. But like, I love that even though your trajectory didn't go maybe quite the way you thought it would whether you're on stage making people laugh, whether you're literally transforming your former teacher, you're transforming her life by your Pilates. <laughs> you know, there's so many ways that you've affected people in such incredible ways, even though maybe it didn't happen in the way you thought it would back when you were 21 and graduating. So I just want to say that out loud because you're truly Well, now I've cried. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Well, and I, for me, I think working with you, working with my clients who deal with chronic pain, working with patients, especially now that I'm working at this neurosurgery practice where I'm working with patients who have complex spinal conditions and and need to have similar surgeries to the ones that we both had. And we also have patients who have brain tumors and aneurysms and strokes. Like, I just have come to realize the reason that I love performing so much was the human connection Mm. and in everything that I do, that's what drives me is finding a way to connect with people and to help them, whether it's by making them laugh or teaching them or providing them with support or sharing their stories that's been like the driving force behind everything that I do. And I think too, because of my experiences working with you just really felt like the most rewarding thing I could do to give back, especially after all that you've taught me and shown me and to be able to help you navigate through your recovery journey and, and, you know, and provide any support in any way was just a pleasure for me because I wouldn't be here without you and I wouldn't be the person I am today without you as a teacher. So again, it really, it just warms my heart that I was able to help you in that way because I feel like it's the least I can do after all you've done Mm. for me over the years. And these are the best full circle moments for teachers is to, to hear you say something like that, but then for me to be able to say to you, and I wouldn't be where I am today without you. It's just like the coolest full circle moment. Me, like hearing that from you two just makes me teary, just sitting and observing that. And <laughs> I just, I thank you both for sharing that. Kind of as we, as we wrap up, Hannah, I'm curious, Cynthia and I are, are both curious what would you say to people who are maybe worried or unsure about whether getting a musical theater degree is really worth it? You know, like when you look back on everything you've done and the training that you've had and where you've ended up, what would you say to folks who are thinking about going into the musical theater industry with the dreams of performing and also then hearing stories like yours and mine, you know, where we've ended up in things that are adjacent to performing in musical theater, but aren't exactly that. What would you say? I would say follow your passions and and follow your dreams, because if you don't, you're going to regret that one day. I know if I didn't go to school for musical theater, I would not be in New York and I would not be living the life that I'm living today. I'd probably be back in Minnesota. I would probably be sitting there thinking, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I had just given it a shot. And so I really do not regret going to school for musical theater. My degree has served me incredibly in everything that I'm doing. And 
I realized too, like I, I didn't need to go to school and get a degree in healthcare administration to work in healthcare administration. I have friends who are, you know, personal trainers and nutritionists, and they've gotten those accreditations and degrees after going to school. Like you can always go back to school if, if there's something else you want to do and pursue. So I would recommend if anyone really wants to pursue this, do it, give it a go, but also have an open mind and be open to the idea that you might not have that ideal career where you're booking show to show to show to show, because to be frank, there are very few actors in this industry who are in that position. Most actors go through dry spells, even really you know, esteemed and prestigious actors who are Tony Award winners and have won, you know, numerous accolades. They're not working 24 seven. And there's moments in their career where they feel like, oh, I'm stuck. So that's something that everyone's going to struggle with. I just encourage you to, as Professor Wagner said, don't look side to side, look forward, focus on your path and be open to that path changing directions. Because a path is changing a direction doesn't mean it's going in a bad direction. And that's something that Mm -hmm. I really learned throughout this journey. After I hurt my back, I was like, this is the end of the world. And it was like 2020. So it kind of was the end of the world, but (laughs) (laughs) a lot changed all at once. But you know, I think about my back injury a lot now, and I'm grateful that it happened because again, I was so unhappy pursuing my performing career. And I was so resistant to changing my path that I ended up hurting myself and doing a huge disservice to myself. So I just encourage you to be open and absorb as much as you can from everybody because you never know what will come in handy in your future. I love that, Hannah. That's just the perfect thing to end on. It's always okay to change your direction. You're going to be constantly learning And hopefully life is long and there are a lot of opportunities that are going to come your way. And in the end, it's your decision what you choose to say yes to. And that can lead to some really exciting places if you're open to it, like you said. Yes, absolutely. And I would like to add, not everybody in a musical or on film and television is in their 20s. So if you don't like book nonstop in your 20s, you're not a failure as an actor. As long as you're a person, Mm. you can be on stage, you can be on screen. You just have to be a human being. So Don't feel like you have like an expiration date on on your career because you can truly perform until you're, you know, a little old lady or a little old man. We need those people to, to tell authentic and true stories. So you have time as long as you are happy and pursuing what you're doing. That's what counts. Oh, amen. Yes, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, Hannah. If you enjoyed today's episode, take a screenshot wherever you're listening to this episode, share it and tag us on Instagram at B-Way Vocal Coach. share it with a friend, and please consider leaving us a review. And by consider, I mean press pause and leave us a review. And if you're ready to take your next step as an actor, but you aren't entirely sure what that should be, take our quiz. We'll strategize with you to outline a roadmap to your unique goals. Plus, from there, you can book a free consult with us. Visit bwayvocalcoach.com backslash take the quiz. We can't wait to hear your story and help you take the next step in your career.